Um, I'm not done grading midterms yet. Nobody's surprised. I'm through problems one through five. I wanted to get through the part one of it so I could actually give you back at least part of, of the test. But then again, I don't think that would be very fair anyway because the, the part one is actually where most of the deductions are. There's more points usually. People do better on seven, seven, eight, nine, and ten anyway. So, uh, but overall scores look look okay. What other than what's our average? I think the median is sitting right around seventy nine. <gasps> oh, oh yeah, okay. Good. Oh. So and there's median. That's that's okay. And because like I said, there's more points to be coming. That's projected. So. I don't like to get into specifics on the low end. I can so out of the 50 points that I've graded so far, I think the low score is around a 20. Um, but don't panic. Um, I also can say nobody has a perfect test. This isn't the year that breaks my streak of no perfect tests. Uh, but there are some really good scores. Josh? Uh, is there any questions you didn't go Undecided. We'll see what the final scores look like as I go. Um, but probably not. I don't usually need to do that. So we'll see. Um, quick random question here. Somebody asked about uh, if, we, if we've ever observed quarks uh, on their own. This is um, this and that's getting into what's called the standard model of physics. And the standard model of physics is basically like a subatomic periodic table where you look at all the different kind of pieces that you can put together in different ways and how different forces are transmitted between objects. Um, and so you get basically. This is oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, Uh, see if I can get just that, um, this, yeah, that one, this table here is all of this, the fundamental pieces of, of matter. So all of our protons and neutrons and electrons, um, are made up, actually electrons are on here. Um, but the rest of these, these purple ones are, are the different flavor, they call them flavors of quarks can tell um, that they were getting really out there and that the physicists who came who found all these particles came up with this in the 60s um, because there's different there's six flavors of quarks there's up quarks and down quarks and top quarks and bottom quarks and charm quarks and strange quarks um, most of those don't actually exist in our everyday life up quarks and down quarks are about all we actually see in everyday matter um, but basically everything that exists in the universe can be made up of these fundamental particles, um, including things like light. You'll notice that photons are on here. Uh, gluons are a particle that's responsible for the strong and weak nuclear forces in the nucleus that hold the nucleus together. They call them gluons because they basically make everything stick together. Um, the Higgs boson is on there is responsible for gravity. So there's a, basically everything comes down to this. Um, and if you're so if you're interested in more about subatomic particles, um, this is a good place to start. The Wikipedia page on the standard model of physics. Um, and I believe that antimatter is on there as well, or is basically the inverse. Everything is inverse if, if we're talking about antimatter. But I'd have to double check. Um, all right, and then, so basically quarks are what make up protons and neutrons specifically. Two up quarks and a down quark is a proton, and two down quarks and an up quark is a neutron. Um, it's, it's more than what we're going to, we'll spend more time on that when we get into nuclear physics, because there are processes by which you can actually have a neutron turn into a proton in the nucleus. And when it does that, it makes an electron. Um, or if it goes the opposite direction, it makes a positron, which is an antimatter electron. So basically things get really weird when you get to subatomic particles, even weirder than 
um, quantum, which is what we're going to talk about for the first half of today. Um, but let me get the slides up. So um, one thing that somebody brought up also was the term oxidizing agent and reducing agent and doing oxidation states. We touched on that at the end of last week, right? Oxidation state when we were talking about ions was really easy, right? What's the oxidation state on this sodium ion here? What is oxidation state? It's most basic. basically just charge right so if it's if it's something like it's an ionic compound especially if it's a, just a regular um you know monoatomic ion oxidation state is just charge the oxidation state on this chloride is minus one the oxidation state on the sodium is plus one the oxidation state on chlorine gas would be what? There's two of them, so it looks, I guess maybe let's start with the easier one. What's the oxidation state on sodium as a metal? What's the charge on it? That's when it's stable, when it's an ion, it's plus one. When it's a metal, it's zero. All right, so this oxidate, if you have something that's going from sodium as a metal, and it's reacting and turning into sodium as an ion, we're going from an oxidation state of zero to an oxidation state of plus one. Is that an oxidation or reduction? Oxidation, right? Oxidation is loss. Oil ring, or Leo says Gert, you've lost an electron, so it's an oxidation. What's the oxidation state on chlorine gas, Cl2? It's neutral, right? So even though there's two atoms, they both, they're both the same, and there's an overall charge of zero, so what's the charge on each atom? It's still zero, right? So when chlorine reacts to make Two chlorides, is that an oxidation or reduction? We went from zero to minus one. So it is reduction, yeah. We're finally getting the hang of gaining an electron means the charge goes down, right? It takes us a while to get used to that. That's normal. So if I put these two reactions together, anytime we have an oxidation, that electron has to go somewhere. Electrons aren't stable just flying around by themselves. They're always gonna find something to stick to to become more stable. So we're never gonna see a reaction under Earth-like conditions where we have an oxidation happening without a reduction paired with it, basically. So that's why we call these redox reactions. You need both, a reduction and an oxidation. It makes sense in terms of the reduction, right? If we're going from a charge of zero to a charge of minus one, those electrons have to come from somewhere, right? Can't make be making atom or um, matter out of nothing. So if we put these two together to get one redox reaction, this would definitely be one we don't want to do at home. We have a reduction and an oxidation happening simultaneously. We can still think about it, though, like it's two separate reactions happening at the same time. The sodium is giving up the electrons through an oxidation. The chlorine is gaining electrons through a reduction and put up, put it together and we get one redox reaction. 
We call each of these, the oxidation and the reduction, we call them half reactions because they're not really going to ever happen without the other one. Why aren't both the sodiums over here? Oh. Because this is when it's sodium is a metal. So anything in its natural state or its pure neutral state on the periodic table has a charge of zero, right? And then it's trying to give up an electron to become more stable. Right? And this goes back to counting protons, neutrons, and electrons on the periodic table, right? Which we still struggled with a little bit on the midterm. Um, if something is neutral, it has the same number of electrons as protons, right? But that doesn't mean it's stable when it's neutral. Because if to be stable, it wants to get having only full or empty orbitals, right? So sodium, when it's neutral, has 11 electrons, but it's trying to become more stable by giving up an electron. That's why it goes through this oxidation process. All right, so the other term I'm going to define here is if we can tell what's the oxidation half reaction and what's the reduction half reaction, there's one more vocab term and it's a little bit confusing um, because it, it's, it uses the word agent and an agent means when acting on something else. And so an oxidizing agent isn't being oxidized, it's oxidizing whatever you put it with. I'll say that again. So an oxidizing agent is oxidizing whatever you put it with. It's not being oxidized itself. It's oxidizing the other chemical. So whatever is being reduced is the oxidizing agent. Right? That word agent means acting on something else. So it means whatever you put it with is going to get oxidized. So what do you suppose the other term I'm going to define is? Reducing agent. Reducing agent. It's the exact opposite. The reducing agent is going to be oxidized. But that's another way of saying, if you redefine those terms, the, the chlorine is being reduced. So you can, you can think of it as being, it's going to oxidize whatever you put it with because it wants to be reduced. The, ox, the reducing agent is going to be oxidized because it, it's a reducing agent because it's going to give away electrons to whatever you put it with. It's going to reduce whatever you put it with. Right? So it just something to pay attention to with these terms um, and that this was on the assignment from yesterday right there were a couple yeah. spots where I had you label oxidizing agent reducing agent um, that's what those terms mean the other thing that that we will go over is if what if it's not as simple as just looking at the charges to decide oxidation state all right so we let's do the um, silicon versus uh, Make from silicon dioxide reaction from the assignment. Actually, even that one's too easy. We'll do it. Let's look at uh, nitrogen gas plus hydrogen gas reacting to make ammonia. First off, we could balance this. And then we're going to look at assigning a charge here. What's the oxidation? Okay, so let's start by balancing. How are we going to balance this? We're going to need a two there because we got two nitrogens on that side. So we know we need to make at least two of these. That gives us a total of six hydrogens. So a three there. Bingo. See, this is why the score goes up on the back half of the test, because you get four points just for balancing all those, those reactions on seven, eight, and nine. 
and I'm confident in everybody's ability to balance reactions at this point, whether or not you're confident in your ability to balance. I'm confident in your ability to balance. All right, so how do we know what's this, if this is a redox reaction or, or a complexation reaction? We start by looking at the charges. What's the oxidation state on the nitrogen over here? Zero, because it's in its neutral state, right? Same for the hydrogen, right? Hydrogen's, the hydrogen gas is neutral in its elemental state, so it's also got a charge of zero. What about over here? As soon as we make a compound, it's not necessarily, even though the compound is neutral and it's covalent, Everything has a full valence, but things aren't necessarily being shared evenly, right? So out of these, nitrogen versus hydrogen, which of them is more electronegative? Nitrogen. Nitrogen's more electronegative, which means it gets first dibs of the electrons. We know that this whole thing adds up to a charge of zero, but nitrogen being more electronegative is the bully. It gets to decide where where uh, where the electrons are all going to go. So how many electrons does nitrogen need to gain to become stable? Three. So being more electronegative, it gets first dibs. The nitrogen's going to have an oxidation state of minus three. So now working backwards, what does the charge have to be on the hydrogen? There's three of them, and all of them have to add up to an overall charge of, my, of plus three. Cancel out the nitrogen. So what was oxidized and what was reduced? Hydrogen started at a zero, and it went to a plus one, which makes it oxidized. The nitrogen started at zero, it went to minus three. So it was reduced. So just because we're, we have a covalent compound or even if it's a polyatomic ion, we can still decide what the oxidation state is by basically treating it like it's an ionic compound. And you just you just give those more electronegative elements first dibs at the electrons. You're still restricted somewhat by, by the element, like hydrogen can never have an oxidation state of plus two. Why could hydrogen not be plus two? It doesn't have two electrons to give up, right? Hydrogen only has one electron to give up when it's neutral. So if hydrogen was a plus two charge, that would mean it has negative one electrons, which isn't a thing, right? So we're still somewhat limited by the total number of electrons. We, we always need to make sure that all of our oxidation states are going to add up to the total charge of the molecule or the polyatomic ion. So last step, what's the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent? What's the oxidizing agent? The nitrogen is the oxidizing agent because it's being reduced, which means by process of elimination, the reducing agent is the hydrogen. All right, and so we defined four different types of reactions the other day, right? When we first did reaction types, and I said, don't worry, we're going to get practice with all these different reaction types. We're going to have at least one lecture on all of those reaction types. So today we're going to focus on, on a quantum mechanics, an orbital concept called hybridization and precipitation reactions. Then we're going to talk about acid-base reactions, and we're going to talk more and more about redox reactions 
So you're getting more and more experience with this. And we're going to keep bringing in stoichiometry and practicing with the stoichiometry as we do it. So we're going to keep building on the stuff we've already done. We don't get to just forget stoichiometry now that we're past the midterm as much as you might want to. Um, that's not how science and math works, right? You can't forget anything because it always comes back. All right. Does anybody have any other questions about the ICA from the uh, assignment from yesterday? Yes? Yeah, it's, if anybody has them ready, I'm happy to do them now, or we can think about it, think about this, and ask me on Friday. All right. And I'm thinking that, how was everybody able to get through the assignment yesterday, other than that one part? Pretty much. Pretty much? Okay. Um, all right then we do have there is an assignment for tomorrow that deals with some practice or a lab for tomorrow but it's basically using stoichiometry to do some calculations to figure out what the actual ratio is of the figure out what the uh, formula is of a compound um, so it'll be more practice with this stuff So then let's talk about some more con concepts, more conceptual stuff. Um, so let's do let's do a practice geometry problem. <clears throat> You've got KCL, potassium chloride is added to a solution of barium nitrate and barium chloride precipitates out. Barium chloride forms a solid. So let's start by writing and balancing the reaction, figuring out the limiting reactant, then figuring out the theoretical yields, and figuring out the percent yield. What state is the KCL in? We know it's potassium chloride, it's going to be reacting. Is it solid, liquid, gas, aqueous? Liquid? It's in milliliters, but it's got a concentration, which tells us that it's aqueous. But that wasn't explicitly uh, put out there. I just want to remind you to look at those units to figure out what state it's in. So KCL, aqueous is added to the same thing for barium nitrate. Barium nitrate, it says solution, right? So that tells us aqueous there as well, right? What's the formula for barium nitrate? BANO3, what's the charge on a barium ion? Plus two, what's the charge on nitrate? So what's our formula? All right, KCL plus barium nitrate reacts and we form a solid barium chloride. What else do we have left over? What else has to be on our react or our product the side? The nitrate and the potassium. So the way these precipitation reactions work is just whatever doesn't form a solid is still there. And if it didn't form a solid, it's still aqueous, right? So we should still have this potassium and the nitrates floating around. Is it balanced? What do we need to do to balance it? There's two nitrates here, so we've got to have two nitrates here. Which means we've got to have a two there. 
And that should take care of everything, right? Mm -hmm. All right, we're almost done setting up our stoichiometry problem. Now we can write in what we have, right? 25.0 mils at 1.20 moles per liter and 15.0 mils at 0.9 moles per liter. Now that we have the reaction written in balance, what's the first step for, for any stoichiometry problem? Put everything in moles. And how do we do that from a concentration? We use the molarity because molarity is what? Moles over liters. So 25.0 milliliters, convert that to liters. I say I finished, I just finished grading this, the conversions part um, of the midterm and only a few people made mistakes like saying a thousand liters in one milliliter. I saw that one once and I saw a thousand centimeters is one meter when we know better, right? And I saw 2.54 inches is one centimeter. I told you I was going to see that one, huh? Always. It's easy to do. You've seen me do it up here on the board, and I've been doing this for years. So, but double check. 1,000 milliliters is one liter. Then what's the next conversion? One liter is 1.20 moles. So 0.025 times 1.2 is going to be 0.03, right? And how many sig figs are we going to take? Three. Remember, this one and this one don't count. So 0.300. Or whatever, what is it when you plug it in, Osa? So if it's exactly 0 0.03, we have to tack on these two extra zeros because those are still sig figs, right? We need three sig figs, even though our calculator only gave us one. So I add the, th the two extra zeros. And that's moles of KCL. We do the same thing here we get 0 0.0135, I think. So what's going to run out first? We have less of it, but we're using up the KCL faster, right? At a two to one ratio. So how do we double check that? Well, if we're using a two to one ratio, we need twice as much KCL. We have more than twice as much KCL, right? So you can do it mentally if you wanted to show your work. We can say, okay, well, 0 0.0135 moles of barium nitrate. And every one mole barium nitrate is two moles KCL used. So that's going to give us 
0 0.027 zero moles KCL used. We've got more than that, right? So that's a pretty good indicator that we did in fact guess the right limiting reagent. All right, we feeling okay about stoichiometry steps at this point? So what are we trying to get? We figured out limiting reactant. We're trying to get theoretical yield and then a percent yield. Which of these two moles am I gonna use? The limiting reactant. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So that's an easy stoichiometry step. Figure out how many moles of product to make. I have 1.135 moles barium nitrate. One mole barium nitrate. One mole product could hit end here on our calculator there and get the exact same number out, or we could also tack on. We could do one more conversion to get us to grams of product, right? To get our theoretical yield in grams. One mole barium chloride. Bearing is not what I have memorized, 137 uh, plus two chlorides. So we're looking at, there we go, 0.36, you said? 0.236. So we'll get a theoretical yield that's about what 2.6 grams maybe 2.81 any questions so far we should all start feeling a little monotonous a little routine at this point right we've done so many of these at this point hopefully this feels really Fairly straightforward anyway. Maybe it's just me. I don't, monotonous, monotonous and boring. If I don't understand something, things aren't really monotonous and boring because I'm just confused instead, right? So hopefully this is monotonous and boring and not confusing, or at least we're making that transition. So last step, percent yield. How do we do percent yield? Actual over theoretical times 100. So 2.45 grams over 2.81 grams times 100. Thank you, Josh. That it's always a gamble when I'm guessing based on people's voices. All right, questions. Uh, another note about something that came up on the test. When we see this in a formula, several of you on the test on number two looked at this and said, well, if I'm multiplying by 100%, that's the same as multiplying by one. So I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do there. Um, I'd never considered that. So I took that into consideration. I didn't mark you down if you did that, but this part of the standard percentage formula, right? As you say times 100% because the only units you should have left or you shouldn't have any units left. You just have a ratio. So the times 100% just means you times by hundred and then stick a percent sign on the end. But like I said, I didn't mark anybody down for that. But Honestly, that's the first time I've ever actually had anybody notice that. And there's like three of you that wrote that. Um, and that was 
unexpected. And I've been asking these questions for a long time now. So good for you. You're keeping my life interesting. All right. So more practice. We're going to keep doing more stoichiometry and conversion practice. At the beginning of every class, it'll be it'll make it more relevant to what we're covering that day, but it's going to be more and more of the same. Um, just so we get to the point where you're doing these in your sleep. All right. Who's ready to talk about quantum mechanics some more then? Oh. You'd rather do quantum mechanics or do more precipitation practice? Ah, uh, it's too bad. This mat this makes more sense to do today before we get into precipitation. Um, so somebody asked me. This actually wasn't. I haven't gone through this weekend's questions yet. Um, but last last year somebody asked me in the asked me a random chemistry question. Who the heck figured out that Vesper geometries are a thing? Um, and that all these weird shapes and that electrons aren't being shared evenly. Um, basically, electronegativity and Vesper geometries and the big concept we're going to talk about today is called hybridization. Most of that came from one person, a guy named Linus Pauling, um, who is one of one of only two people to have uh, two Nobel Prizes, one in, in two different areas. Um, so there's now three people total that have it, have two Nobel Prizes, but the third one, uh, a guy named Sharpless from San Diego, just he got both of his in chemistry, so he doesn't count. Uh, Marie Curie and Linus Pauling are the only two that have that each have a Nobel Prize in no, Marie Curie's was in physics and chemistry, Pauling was in chemistry and actually won the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, because he did a lot of work with nuclear disarmament during the Cold War. Um, and this is just a good picture that he actually, he got interviewed by Rolling Stone in the seventies. And this was, they sent a photographer out to his house in Big Sur and they were just taking a random picture of him and his kitten jumped on his shoulder. So this is a Rolling Stone picture. He loved cats. He lived in Big Sur at the same time as a lot of the um, folk rock movement of the of the sixties and seventies. So when Neil Young and everybody was living, hanging out in Big Sur, um, they were hanging out with Linus Pauling because if you're a Nobel chemistry winner, then why not hang out with rock stars in, by the ocean? Uh, so a really fascinating guy. I actually got to meet one, had one of his great nieces as a student. She lived up here a few years ago, went to LTCC, um, which I could not, I was like, it was like meeting a rock star. You're related to be Linus Pauling? Um, so strong Northern California ties. Um, he's the one who figured out how Vesper geometries work and then why mathematically. Um, so if we, if we think about orbitals a little bit, there were four quantum numbers that we used to describe these orbitals, right? Um, I'm sure nobody really wants to spend a whole lot of time going into this because this might be bringing up some, some unresolved trauma. Um, but the basics of it is that we had these, all of those quantum numbers put together gave us a way to describe an orbital, right? From the, from the um, midterm, this piece here is a way to describe not just where something is on the periodic table, but a specific orbital and a state of that orbital. It's in the third energy, the P orbital has six electrons in it, right? There you go. Um, so that's an example of what's called an atomic orbital. But the thing is, as soon as you start mixing these together, or as soon as you start making covalent bonds, you don't really have atomic orbitals anymore. Right? So this is a picture we've seen before, looking at the different, uh, different energy levels and sublevels and how many electrons you can put in each of them. If we start looking at just the atomic orbital shapes, uh, we would find that all of these different different compounds, they don't actually naturally start out in these Vesper geometries 
because if you looked at sulfur or dihydrogen sulfide, naturally happens when you get an hydrogen atom coming up to a sulfur 3p orbital and another sulfur 3p orbital, those are 90 degrees from each other. But if dihydrogen sulfide, if we look at its Lewis dot structure, looks like this, how many electron groups does it have? Four, which, which means what's its electron geometry? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral is not 90 degrees from each other, are they? So basically, Pauling looked at, at some of these, these numbers that were coming back, said, well, atomic, the atomic orbitals are 90 degrees from each other, but this, this molecule, they're closer to 105 in this case, degrees between the two hydrogens. So something else has to be happening. Basically, we're not dealing with just atomic orbitals anymore, was what he figured out. We're, what we're actually dealing with is what's called hybrid orbitals. Um, so here's another example. If we put carbon, if we just looked at carbons, atomic orbitals, its atomic orbitals would look like this, right? And that would suggest that you only have two partially filled suborbitals. So that would say that carbon can only make two bonds. But we know that that's not true, right? We know that carbon can make up to four bonds because we've seen, and even back in the early 1900s, they knew the formula for methane was CH4. But the atomic orbital theory, the early quantum mechanics, would say that you could only make two bonds out of carbon. So clearly, atomic orbitals is not the whole story. And so that's what Linus Pauling took and said, well, if these orbitals are really just functions, they're just three-dimensional functions that have a specific shape in space. Well, every, I think you, at this point, everybody's seen, seen in math things that look like this. G of X equals F of X plus H of X, where you could break up one function and it really is the sum of two other functions. There's nothing that, to stop us from taking these atomic orbitals and just sort of mixing them together. And so that's what Linus Pauling called a hybrid orbital, a hybridized orbital. Was, but instead of saying that you have a 2s orbital and 2p orbitals, you can mix them together to get four orbitals that are a mixture of s and p. All right, so for carbon, it would look something like this. Your 2s is lower in energy than your 2p. But if you take all three of the 2p orbital suborbitals and mix them together with the 2s, we can get four orbitals that are all the same energy that are kind of in between 2s and 2p. And this is literally all this is, is taking those functions and adding them together. And really, it's more like a weighted average where you say, okay, it's the energy is going to be 0.75 of, of the wave between 2s and 2p. But the, the number doesn't really make, make any difference. What, what you get when you add these orbitals together is not only does it gives you four orbitals that are each halfway filled so that carbon can make four bonds, they're also naturally 109.5 degrees from each other spatially they're automatically wind up lining themselves up so that they're as far away from each other as possible so this actually solves two issues with one it solved the issue with well we know carbon can make four bonds and it solved the issue of well this dihydrogen sulfide should be 90 degrees if we just look at atomic orbitals but it's really uh 109 degrees right and so how does this actually matter? This is this is all kind of cool. Is there anything we can actually do with this at this level other than just say, well, now things don't disagree with each other as much? Um, basically, talking about the hybridization of these orbitals is a really convenient way to talk about electron geometry without having to use the words tetrahedral, trigonal planar, trigonal bipyramidal, if you can just use the hybridization as a shorthand. It turns out every that the number of hybrid orbitals you make 
that you need to make to form these bonds is the number of electron domains that you have. I'll say, I'll say that again. The number of electron domains you have around your central atom is the same as the number of hybridized orbitals that you need. So something that has a tetrahedral electron geometry always has to mix together an S orbital and three pieces of a P orbital to get a total of four electron domains. So instead of saying, basically this allows us to ignore electron geometry and just say, instead of saying electron geometry is tetrahedral, we can just say that it's analogous to say that the hybridization is sp3. And so what this means, what sp3 means, is that you take one s orbital and all three pieces of a p orbital, and you mix them all together to get a total of four electron groups. So these two things mean the same thing. If you've got an atom that's sp3, it's also got a tetrahedral electron geometry. What if we don't have four electron groups? What if we have something like boron trihydride? Boron trihydrides, uh, Lewis dot structure looks like this. It doesn't have four electron groups. So it's not going to have four hybridized orbitals. Instead of mixing together all three pieces of the p orbital plus a part of the s orbital, it's going to start from the s orbital because that's lowest energy. And it's only going to mix together two pieces of a p orbital. So instead of sp3, its hybridization would be sp2. So basically, if you sum up the exponents on these hybrids on the hybridization, that's how many electron domains you have around your central atom. Right. So sp2 is another way of saying trigonal planar. Sp3 is another way of saying tetrahedral electron geometry. Um, and this is a slide that has a good a good figure showing how you start from the individual shapes, the individual functions. And when you mix them together, you get these three tetrahedrally oriented orbitals. If you look at where they add, where there's constructive interference and destructive interference and cancel things out, they naturally arrange themselves into this, S, into this tetrahedral geometry. Now, is this all that useful now? Not necessarily. But if you're going to take more chemistry, it's going to be useful. You can ask my OCHEM students. It's by far the easiest way to describe how electrons behave when we start talking about organic molecules. We talk about, well, that carbon's an sp2, so it has these certain properties. That carbon's an sp3, so I know it's tetrahedral. So it, it's a concept that winds up coming back, especially when we start talking about resonance structures and how electrons behave in organic molecules, because it turns out this idea of taking different orbitals and adding them together to get a new orbital shape is the best way of approximating what the orbitals actually look like in a covalent compound. They don't actually look like an S orbital or a P orbital as soon as you make covalent bonds. They start looking like hybridized orbitals. All right. Um, this figure, ignore the text at the top right now. This is what we were just talking about. If you only have three things taking up space, three electron domains, 
we're basically not going to mix in this last piece of the p orbital. This last piece of the p orbital doesn't need to be included if you only need to make three bonds. If we only need to make three bonds, we're going to basically just leave a p orbital alone. So instead of having three parts p to one part s, it's two parts p to one part s. And the way we signify that is by saying it's sp2. So what if we only have two hybridized orbitals? Are we going to mix together? What are we going to mix together to make two electron domains? Would we be, would we just say p2? Which orbitals, which pieces are we going to mix together? If we need to make two electron domains, we need two hybridized orbitals. Which two orbitals should we mix together? We'll always start with the lowest energy because it's the most stable, right? And then you're going to mix in one of the three pieces of a p orbital. So if there's two electron domains, it's not sp3, it's not sp2. Just sp1 or just sp, right? All all we're really doing is if you again, if you add up the exponents on these, that's the number of electron domains you have. To go back to our Vesper geometry language, now, why do lone pairs still factor into this? Well, because they still need a space to be. And so anything that takes up space around that central atom has to be in one of these hybridized orbitals as well. So even though a lone pair is not a bond, it still is going to sit in one of these hybridized orbitals because it still needs space. So that's where the Vesper geometry aspect comes into it. Right? The, the way that you can minimize the electron-electron repulsions is by having these orbitals naturally spread out away from each other, right? Like we talked about with in the Vesper Geometries lab. And the way that that happens mathematically, we can describe that by saying that's a hybridized orbital. We're just mixing these different functions together. All right, and so that's why when we look at the geometry of of ammonia, say, NH3, the Lewis dot structure looks like looks like this. You have four things taking up space, three bonds, but also this lone pair needs the spot to be. So the fact that you have four things taking up space tells you you need four hybridized orbitals. So one part S and three parts P. The sum there of the exponents is four. All right, so hope the point I'm trying to drive home is that hybridization and the way we describe hybridization really is like a one-to-one -one translation to electron geometry. Anything that has a tetrahedral electron geometry will be sp3. Anything that has a trigonal planar electron geometry will be sp2. Questions so far? I know I I remember seeing this as I was probably I was probably 17 or 18 the first time I saw this, and I remember thinking. I'm just going to memorize enough of this so that I don't get a zero on the test and then I'm going to immediately forget it. And I regret that because it came back over and over and over again um, as I went on in chemistry. Right? So once we get, start talking about hybridized orbitals, we don't put the um, the energy level in front of it anymore. So we would just say sp3. Good question. Okay. 
So exactly. So the next thing is, what about those double bonds? Those du double bonds really only count as one electron group, right? Because they have to be in the same space here. So what does that do to our, our hybridization for this carbon here? It's only got three electron groups, even though it's got eight electrons. What would we, what would we assume the hybridization is? It's got three electron groups. It's got how many hybridized orbitals? Three. So two p orbitals though. The s, and then two parts p. The total of three things taking up space. If it's helpful. You can remember, you can think about putting a one here. Add up the exponents, and that's how many electron domains you have. So sp two. Well, what about that double bond? Did we talk about sigma bonds versus pi bonds yet? It would stick out because sigma, right? So basically, if you have a double bond, it doesn't behave like a single bond anymore. It's not like it's just two of the same thing next to each other. We draw it like that. But that's not actually what they look like. If you have, if you're making a double bond, a double bond basically looks like two unhybridized p orbitals. They're kind of next to each other, and they sort of spread out to make this sort of canoe shape. Basically, if you if you have, if we're just looking at the carbon and the oxygen here. The sp2 orbital on the carbon is going to look something like that. And the oxygen is going to look something like that. And where those two orbitals overlap, that's a sigma bond. That's a single bond, the first bond, the strongest bond. So where sigma actually means sigma. The best yeah. bond. Did I use that right? Yeah, that's Sweet. <laughs> So the best bond is a sigma bond. You get the most orbital overlap between these orbitals this way. When we need to make a double bond though, we can't just put them in the same spot and make two sigma bonds because this space is already taken up. So what happens instead, is that just the door closing? What happens instead is we basically leave one of those p orbitals unhybridized. And you get something that looks like, and remember, an unhybridized p orbital basically looks like a figure eight. And then you do you have the same thing on the oxygen. The oxygen is also going to have an unhybridized p orbital, and so this the second bond that forms isn't as good as the first bond because you can't get these to overlap with each other as well as you can when they're pointed right at each other. So basically this carbon, even though it has four pairs of electrons around it, it only has a trigonal planar geometry because you only have three hybridized orbitals making sigma bonds. Then you've got one unhybridized orbital that's sticking into the board and out of the board in this case, that's going to be able to overlap a little bit with the oxygen to make this sort of, I've had students say it looks like a canoe or vampire fangs or whatever you want to call it. This, this type of bond is a pi bond. And a pi bond is what you get with P orbitals that aren't hybridized trying to make a bond. Right, and so that's why when we have, even though we have a total of four bonds, we only have three hybridized orbitals, which gives us an electron geometry of, with three domains. Right, so all of this should be kind of tying together. It's basically the explanation for why this is considered having three electron domains, even though it's got four bonds. It's because that fourth bond is a pi bond. 
And so it's not hybridized like everything else. Keep going. I seem to have, there we go. So for this molecule, this CH2O, the orbitals are actually going to look something like this. You have three sigma bonds around the carbon. No, not yet. Uh, not yet. Not yet. This winds up being really, again, the more you go into chemistry, the more important this will be. If you don't go into chemistry, you can you know, get by just by understanding sp2 means trigonal planar. Um, but the more you want to actually understand how chemicals work, how they react, and especially even when you go, if you wanted to go into something like biochemistry, the way we describe how different bonds are breaking or forming in cells due to the enzymes in catalyzed reactions, we can understand a lot of that by talking about the types of orbitals and the hybridization of these orbitals. Um, so it winds up being something that's kind of a foundational concept. You can get by without knowing it in the sciences, but if you really want to understand what's happening, especially if you want to go to grad school, um, hybridization winds up being kind of an important topic. So that's why, and like I said, I kind of ignored it until I got to grad school and I regretted it because I did lots of my research involved hybridized orbitals. Um, so I shot myself in the foot a little bit by not studying it. Henry? Uh, so like, if, what if your thing is not playing it? Is your unhybridized is your unhybridized orbital molecule still like interfere with your other hybridized orbital molecule? Like, they do interact a little bit, yeah. So here's another example. Let's look at CO2. Lewis dot structure for CO2 looks like this, right? So if we're talking about the electron geometries, the oxygens are both going to be trigonal planar, but the carbon's linear. The carbon has to have two unhybridized p orbital pieces because it's got to make a pi bond going this way, and then it's got to make another pi bond going that way. And so when you have two unhybridized p orbitals, what you get is you get something that looks kind of like this, do I actually have that on the next slide, maybe? Mm, no, I don't. I started talking about triple bonds. You get something that looks kind of like this at first, where if we've got our carbon here, you're going to have a hybridized orbital pointing to the right and a hybridized orbital pointing to the left. You're going to have an oxygen over here with a hybridized orbital overlapping to make your first sigma bond. Oxygen over here is going to have a sigma bond. The other parts of the p orbital on that center carbon, well, we can make one of them go up and down here, just like we did here, where there's a p orbital and p orbital on the oxygen here. And so they can wind up overlapping to make a, a uh, pi bond, just like we saw there, right? Same general shape. The other unhybridized p orbital that's left is has to be perpendicular to these ones. They can't get in the way of each other. They have to be 90 degrees. If you think back to that first slide when we were looking at this slide. These three pieces of the p orbital are all 90 degrees to each other, right? They're all perpendicular. In, in uh, mathematical language, we call them orthogonal to each other, meaning they're made up of, of non, let's see, I'm not going to define orthogonal right now because I'm going to butcher the definition. Um, basically, spatially, we can think of them as being perpendicular to each other. So where do the other ones go? If this pi bond is up and down in the plane of the board, they're into the board and out of the board, exactly. So you wind up with your second pi bond is into the board and behind the board. 
And so they do wind up still staying interacting with each other. And this is why when something only has two electron groups around it, as two pi bonds here, it only has two orbitals that it can hybridize. It's got the S orbital and one of the P pieces. So the hybridization on the on the carbon here is just SP. What if you have like like six electrons that are with whatever and then two and they like they there's like no more space for them So let's go the other way. I see what you're saying. So if we go the other way, we can't increase our hybridization past sp3 with only using s orbitals and p orbitals. So what's the next orbital we could involve? 3s or d. Oh, yeah. Right. Remember how we only break the oct that octet rule when we get to n equals 3. So we mix in d a little bit. All right. More on this on Friday. And your tests on Friday. I will give you. I will give you your test back. Deadline for me, not you. Okay. Um, that one where they. Um, let me pull it up. They use the ashless filter paper and the crucibles. So we start with the hydrate and then they drive off the water and then they break it down further to get a solid and they filter the solid and then burn off the filter paper. I I only suggested adding it because uh, because we've done it in the past, but geometry. Oh, it's so yeah. Thank you. You've got this many grams of, of calcium. Juice, 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 juice. That's right. What's your chemical for that? Let me see. Uh, let me let me exit Zoom too. What is it? End meeting. Right above. I'll do that, and then it'll show up. Then I can get it. 